putting the team together, creating a safe place where it's really focused on belonging, uh, and then having uh, a platform and, and keeping this where like each aspect of the day-to-day, and in our case at the journal, we think, what are we doing well and what do we need to be doing better in this space? When saving lives is what you do, your standards are anything but standard. In fact, you set them higher than most to deliver results that patients can depend on. You refuse to compromise. We couldn't agree more. We are Edwards Life Sciences, and like you, we believe that good is never good enough. Rising to the challenge of today's TAVR patients isn't just a mission, it's a commitment. And because you set a higher standard, we set our sights on meeting you there. Welcome to the higher standard, your standard. Learn more at edwardstaver.com. You're listening to Parallax from Radcliffe Cardiology in association with makeadent.org. Here is your host, Ankur Kalra, MD from the Cleveland Clinic. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of Parallax. Um, you know, this is uh, a unique episode. Um, it's in collaboration with the Heart Failure Society of America, uh, you know, which um, everyone at Parallax and at Radcliffe Group Limited is extremely grateful for. Um, you know, I would sh- give a huge shout out to uh, Dr. Starling, Randy Starling, who I have the immense privilege of, you know, working with uh, here at the Cleveland Clinic. And um, my guests uh, t- today are, you know, two extremely vibrant and special people. I'm going to introduce e- each one of them. Um, Dr. Mentz uh, is on the show with us. Uh, Robert Mentz is Associate Professor of Medicine at Duke. Uh, he's the Section Chief of Heart Failure at Duke and uh, took over as uh, editor-in-chief. So he's at the helm for Journal of Cardiac Failure, which happens to be the official journal for the Heart Failure Society of America. And with him is uh, Dr. Lala. So Anu Lala is uh, a heart failure cardiologist at ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Uh, she's assistant professor of medicine and the deputy editor of Journal of Cardiac Failure. And she also has an appointment, an academic appointment uh, at Population Health Sciences and Health Policy at Mount Sinai. So just two incredibly special guests. And, uh, you know, I've, we've been wanting to do this for a while. And I think the excitement is, um, is equally shared. I, I would, I would believe with both Anu and, and Rob. So Anu and Rob, welcome on the show. And thank you so much for doing this. Well, thank you so much. It's really a privilege. And just as you said, we've, we've been excited to do this and are eager to have the conversation tonight and hopefully continue the discussion. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Love your podcast. Love the organic nature of the conversations that you have. So we're excited to be on. Oh, no, the, the privilege is ours, quite frankly. So I'm going to get started here, um, probably with you, Rob, first. Uh, and then Anu, you know, uh, will chime in. Um, and then, you know, we'll sort of, you know, go in a vice versa fashion. But Rob, um, you know, we're, we're doing this series in collaboration with the Heart Failure Society of America. And the, the theme is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, you know, it's also referred to as DEI. Um, so Rob, um, would you, would you explain to us, um, you know, what, um, according to you, diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, stands for? It's, it's been a important core piece, uh, is the journal has uh, taken on the new editorial team. Um, and maybe just to kind of start from the beginning. Uh, so Anu and I took over as the editor and deputy editor in December. And from the earliest conversations, we really wanted to think, how can we do things differently at the journal to put together a team that really represents and is, is made up of the diversity that is within academic medicine, as well as really striving to, to improve that over time uh, by all different domains of inclusiveness. So really this idea of, as as we think of putting together a team uh, of men and women, uh, of those different race and ethnicity, different disciplines, cardiology, nurse practitioners, APPs, 
uh, foreign DMs, physical therapists, so really pulling together different components and different types of diversity, career stage, geography. So it, it really began from the first conversations, as we said, how do we put together what we think represents the best in terms of diversity of cardiology and specifically heart failure? And then from there, it really evolved and it became a passion and one of our core values is we thought, how do we have DEI be front and center on every single conversation we have uh, as we think about the people that are part of the journal team, the reviewers, authorship, and it's really been a, a core value that has, has been a foundation as we've moved forward and something that we've learned a lot about from our team and are really eager to learn from the broader community and work together for really significant and permanent change. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a great answer, Robin. You know, you mentioned about it being a core principle um, within the uh, editorial board of Journal of Cardiac Failure. Um, for someone who's listening and someone who wants to um, sort of promote diversity, equity, and inclusion within his or her sphere of work or realm, what are some of the practical tips you would give, uh, you know, to, to people um, uh, who are wanting to imbibe this, um, you know, in their uh, areas of work, you know, whether it, whether it's as an editor in chief or whether it's you know as an attending physician or whether it's as a professor of medicine at a certain university or as a department chairman or as a section chief, uh, d- describe to us some of the practical elements of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in terms of its application? Yeah, thank you. So that's a, a really good question. Um, and I would take humble steps to, to try to answer it to the best that I can. But in terms of some real practical tips, just like I said, it's starting from a place of being purposeful about putting the team together. Uh, so I think really reaching out and understanding uh, who might be interested in being involved and then going further and, and really pushing the boundaries and making sure that you're, you're being inclusive and actually not just focusing on DEI, but also the belonging piece. That's a really important piece that we've learned about just hearing from our team uh, is making sure we're, we come from a place of everyone feels safe and comfortable uh, that, that we're responsive um, and I, you know, I'd be very transparent about this. We've made mistakes along the way where we've tried to be inclusive and have messed things up. Uh, and I, I, one of the things that I've been most proud about is actually that our team feels comfortable enough to come to us and say, listen, you guys messed up. Uh, let, let's think through this and, and see how we can rectify this and really have a better pathway forward. So I think some initial pearls are putting the team together creating a safe place where it's really focused on belonging uh, and then having uh, a platform and and keeping this where each aspect of the day-to-day, in in our case at the journal, we think what are we doing well and what do we need to be doing better in this space? And for us, it's been very practical at a journal level of whenever we're inviting reviewers, we want to think about having a diverse group of, of reviewers that are reviewing articles. We've tried to be very transparent uh, about how can we uh, have, you know, unbiased language. So putting that in our author instructions about what what we want authors to do when they're putting their submissions into us. Uh, and I'm excited to share other aspects that we can talk maybe more in detail uh, around double blind reviews. How can we reduce bias in the review process? So for a journal perspective, those are some of the practical things. Uh, but I think it's even broader in terms of whether you're inviting editorials, whether, whether really putting down our stake to say we want that when you are submitting your content to us to have diverse authorship uh, and really have representation from the, the broad team that was really part of the research experience. Yeah, no, I mean, again, this is, um, you know, just a, a terrific explanation of, um, you know, the concept of diversity, equity and inclusion. And, and I should also add belonging, such so a D-E-I-B, D-E-I and B. Uh, you know, belonging is an important piece. You know, I, I learned this from Mother Swaminathan, who is the former president of American Society of Echo. Uh, the concept of diversity is 
you know, inviting someone to the party, but getting them on the dance floor is what inclusion is. As and that, that sort of that is sort of stuck with me as you know I've kept thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I just wanted to to add. I think you hit the nail on the head, and I think Rob has already, as usual, nicely highlighted the fact that this this notion of belonging really lies at the center of DEI. And I, you know what strikes me is I think fundamentally the innate human desire for all of us is to feel seen right? And to feel acknowledged. And then that is what underlies this important concept of belonging. And when we think about DEI in sort of a a superficial sense, which is, you know, become a buzzword, um, it's really about having everyone feel like they belong, right? Feel like they are included, like you said, like they're on the dance floor. And I think when when that's at the core of everything you do is, is, is making sure that people feel seen and heard and acknowledged and recognized, then thankfully, and at least that's our wish, is that things flow from there. And so when you think about DEI, you think about it across, of course, wanting to um, include and really promote um the inclusion of underrepresented groups, but then also think about what it means to belong and feel included on all levels, like Rob said, right? From the author perspective, from the reviewer perspective, from the editor perspective, from the patient perspective. Um, And so I think it all kind of stems out from that central concept, like spokes of a wheel. Um, And I think that's been our kind of guiding principle and we're, you know, it's our, it's our hope that it will continue to be uh, our, our sort of North Star. Um, and we've been fortunate that, that ideas have flown from there. Yeah, no, no, this is absolutely terrific. So uh, I know, let me, uh, let me, uh, you know, ask you this one uh, first, and then, you know, Rob can, can chime in. In terms of um, working um, through the platform of a journal, and, you know, by the way, congratulations on a on an incredible new impact factor. I mean, that's, that's just incredible. Uh, so congratulations to, uh, to you, uh, you know, as well as the former team. Um, because, uh, you know, I know it's a lot of work to build a journal and build a, a repertoire. So, and, you know, with all the new, uh, changes that I see happening with the journal, there's a lot of new energy. Um, and I, I can just sense the effervescence, you know, which is so, so palpable. Uh, you know, across social media that, uh, you know, I congratulate both you, um, and, and Rob for taking on these important steps. Um, but, but, you know, in terms of, um, in terms of some of the editorial processes, you know, how, uh, describe to the listeners, or to the audience, um, you know, some of the steps that you've taken to promote, um, you know, DEI and B. Yeah, sure. So, so thank you for that question. Um, you know, I'll, I'll let Rob speak about impact factor because he does so more eloquently than I, but certainly the credit goes to the, the team before us. As you know, the impact factor kind of is delayed. Um, and so, so we definitely want to acknowledge them as you did um, for their tremendous work in, in contributing to that coming up the way it did. Um, in terms of you know, what have we done in a concrete fashion? I'm so glad that you asked that because one thing that, that Rob and I say all the time is like, let's not talk the talk, let's walk the walk. And so everything we sit, we, we get to meet regularly, um, on, on Fridays and we like spend the whole hour together and it feels like time just flies by before, Um, you know, the the hour is up and we're like, oh my God, there's so much more that we can talk about. So it it really speaks to the fact that this is something we're both really passionate about. Our publishing director is just an incredible person, incredibly knowledgeable as well. And so I think that that natural chemistry and respect for one another um, facilitates making things happen. And so coming back to the original point, any idea that we come up with, you know, we all check ourselves and say, are we walking the walk? And, uh, you know, nothing is more important than doing that in the DEIB space. And so, um, you know, it really depends on which aspect we're looking at, right? So to me, that is first outlining, I think, being very clear about what our values are and what DEIB means 
to us at the journal. And so I'd say the first step that we um, took was to create a DEI statement that outlined our core values that really was very um, concrete about what it is that we wanted, that one, it was a priority, and then what that meant. And, you know, we wanted to have diversity amongst authors. We wanted to have bias-free language. We wanted to have submissions. We want to encourage submissions that highlight diversity in, in all dimensions and analyses. Um, we want to remind authors and reviewers to use sensitive and, and respectful language, uh, especially when referring to underrepresented groups. Um, and really our, our hope um, is, I say prayer, but not in a religious sense, but I think our prayer is that we can promote DEI and be of course, across science and across the journal, but, you know, for our community at large. So I think first outlining those steps in a concrete statement was very helpful for us to be clear with our vision. Yeah, thanks. I mean, you said it so nicely that maybe additional things I would add to complement that. Um, you mentioned our Friday meetings as part of the core group with Meredith Hurt, our, um, our director of publishing, that is always this like invigorating meeting. But I also want to note our weekly meeting with our associate editor teams, which has just been an opportunity to bring together a diverse group in and of itself, and then to create a space to discuss articles in a critical fashion and be very purposeful about what types of articles we want to select that are aligned with our core values and really based on exceptional science and really each of these high quality um, components of DEI that you've also gone through. So it, it comes and starts from our weekly meetings in the team that we're so fortunate to have on the associate editor side. But then it's also been very purposeful around when we're inviting editorials or state-of-the-art reviews to be purposeful about including both men and women, making sure that we have at least suggestions around considering including trainees, diverse stakeholders, uh, that maybe other components or different disciplines within medicine. And those are some of the things that we've been really excited about. And then the last comment I would make is just this month with our launching of double blind reviews uh, and how through our publisher Elsevier really being able to work very purposefully and meaningfully to, to turn this uh, on, but then to be collecting data around it. So we'll hopefully be able to share insights now as we've gone from having uh, single blind reviews, meaning that the reviewers themselves know who the authors are, to now both the reviewers and the authors being unaware of each other. So it really is a base, uh, the basis on quality of the science uh, and to try to remove some of the potential biases uh, that, that could go against our overall mission. So that's been something we've been really excited to launch just this month and hopefully down the line. Maybe we can even join back and go through some of the updated insights around that. Um, so, you know, just, I mean, I've, I've been a former editor-in-chief of a peer-reviewed journal, and, you know, I know the amount of work that goes into putting an issue together. And, you know, just the fact that you've, you know, you've introduced all these concepts and, and wonderful ideas, you know, and congratulations on the double-blind peer review process. I think that is crucial um you know having been both um you know i'm just being being honest and, and candid here you know just being both at the uh, you know obviously at the receiving end uh, but also you know challenging my own inherent biases when i see a manuscript as a reviewer uh, from a, an author group that i know is prolific and has published great science in the past you know i think is is an inherent bias that I still struggle with as a reviewer. So I, I'm sure that blinding it, you know, like double blinding it would, would make a difference uh, in, in terms of, you know, reading that particular paper with, with an unbiased, open, you know, mind. And, you know, just focusing on the science and not focusing on, you know, who's, who's, uh, you know, producing the science. I think that is, that is extremely important. Um, let me ask you uh, a, a technical question about this aspect. Do you think that it's still um, feasible or it's still uh, possible to sort of make sense as to where, where, where this paper is coming from? You know, just because 
for example, you know, if there is a registry which, you know, people know about and, you know, y- you would know that you would associate a certain uh, person or a certain group of authors with that particular registry, or if it's a database study and, you know, everybody knows uh, who sort of minds the database, um, what, do, do you think it's even possible to blind uh, to that extent? Uh, I mean, what, what are some of the uh, editorial guidelines and policies you have introduced um, to sort of mitigate that? Yeah, I'm happy to, to kind of take that and then Anu, feel free to jump in. So I think we're still learning exactly what it looks like, but based at the most basic level, and, and this is where it's a balance, right? So one of the key things at our journal is we have this your paper, your way. So you can submit to our journal in you know just a couple minutes uh, and, and not have to put in everybody's name. And it, it, you know, it doesn't take hours and hours to do it. So we balance it with the ease of submission and trying to improve the author experience. But now we are asking uh, for basically these blinded details, meaning that we want to separate out the cover page that has the authors, the affiliations. But your point is a really good one. I mean, there are aspects of, you know, if it's from trial X, then we're going to be thinking, oh, this is probably the, the group of individuals that has been publishing all these papers on that. So there are certainly cases where I think it is much more challenging um, to, to blind in a complete way, just given the data set. But there are a number of instances where, whether it's a single center or multi-center, a smaller piece, or, um, you know, not from a specific data set that is, can be as clearly articulated, uh, or in our case could actually be blinded through fairly easy mechanisms that I think will allow us to get closer, uh, and, and hopefully make some incremental progress on trying to remove some of the bias there. So I think stay tuned. We're still learning exactly what that will look like, but I think already we've seen an ability to blind some of the key factors around institutions, affiliations, uh, to really try to get to the heart of the matter of focusing on the science. But Anu, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you always say it so nicely. (laughs) I, I think what I'm really excited about is being transparent with our community. Because I'm as much as I'm excited about the prospect of doing blinded reviews, because, again, this is walking the walk rather than how many times have we seen this in in various reviews and various perspective pieces as to what we can do to change uh, the diversity of authorship, et cetera. And so we're so excited to be able to do this. Um, But I'm so equally excited about sharing just are the lessons learned, you know, how does this change? What is, what is the impact? You know, how does authorship change, et cetera? I think obviously, you know, we're privy to the fact that there'll be some restrictions and some red tape in terms of what exactly we may or may not be able to find out, but that too is worth sharing. You know, I think uh, the more transparent we are in these processes, the less of a chasm there is between, you know, editorial boards and reviewers and authors and um, the community at large. And so I think sharing all of this information as we roll it out is going to be, is going to be nice. Yeah. So, you know, that is, um, that is one piece. Um, What are some of the other changes, you know, besides, um, and and I'm going to probably ask the leading question here, you know, for example, and, and, you know, this is still uh, under review, uh, but hopefully I think it's going to get published in, in one of the uh, leading peer reviewed journals in cardiology where, you know, our group looked at uh, the editorials that have been published in cardiovascular medicine across the spectrum of all the usual suspect journals for, you know, cardiology. And, you know, we, we looked at PubMed and Medline and, and we sort of used, um, you know, special software to, to look uh, for identification of race. And the, the idea was to get into, uh, the percentage of white versus black versus Asian versus, you know, non-Hispanic whites and, 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 and Latinas. So basically across the spectrum of all races, um, sort of quantify what percentage of editorials are written by, you know, authors from these different groups of races. Now I'm not going to get into the results because that is obviously under embargo. Um, because, and, you know, the, the reason we wanted to study this was, you know, ed- editorials for the most part are invited by, 
by the journal editors. So, you know, it's a good um, segue or it's, it sort of is a, is a good snapshot into getting a sense of what these inherent biases are, right? Uh, uh, and, you know, um, the, the findings to me were, were provocative, but um, have, have you included D, E, I, and B, the concept in, you know, for example, in writing editorials for Journal of Cardiac Failure? Yeah, th- thank you for reading this. <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, next time hopefully you'll submit uh, to, to our journal as well, because I mean, this is a, a key passion of ours, as Anu said, is we want to share insights like you're describing more broadly. But the, the short answer is that, yes, this has been front and center for us. So every single time we're uh, inviting an editorial, we think, how can we have diverse authorship? And we're, we've been very purposeful about our invited state of our reviews that'll be for the next year now, as we set out those timelines to basically indicate that we're mandating uh, a diverse author group and by each of these different domains and really putting it um, as a core principle and in, in being very specific in our language to potential editorialists and authors. But Anu, what would you add to that? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. The reason I, I kind of chimed in at the same time and it was like, oh, you know, when he said, are you, are you purposeful in terms of how you invite editorials? You almost feel like laugh because uh, laughing because that's, we are so purposeful. Um, and I think it's made us more conscientious individuals in general, quite frankly, um, even outside of the, the journal. Um, I, I, it's just, you know, so much comes from awareness. I think the other thing that we've made an effort to do is really highlight those who are at the trainee level. So the early career and the trainee um, level, I think oftentimes there's a notion that, um, you know, people at that level feel like, oh, well, how am I going to ever get on a state of the art paper? Or how am I going to ever get on a guideline or, or write an impactful paper with these key, you know, mentors in the field? And I think including them on major papers, quite frankly, uh, perspective pieces, the entire gamut of what we publish in the journal early on, um, also speaks to inclusion and belonging, right? And so I think our early career and trainee spotlight is something we're really, really proud of. We're really lucky to have three incredible fellows in training um, serve at, at the helm uh, in regards to that section. And then, you know, the the pieces that come forth, um, we, we hope that they're diverse. They have fortunately been thus far. And then amplifying those messages and amplifying the diversity in authorship and social media has been really, really rewarding, I think, for both both parties involved. Yeah, maybe just to add kind of one comment that around that. Thanks for highlighting the ECT spotlight, which has been just a lot of fun to see the uh, rising stars in heart failure and to be able to profile the diverse group of individuals. And I think similarly, just with the emphasis appropriately, as we've seen this year around some of the high-profile uh, missteps where there's a complete mantle uh, uh, for a talk uh, or for a, a session where there is a lack of diversity across the board at some of these virtual or, or now in-person meetings. And I think that's led many of us to rather than, you know, before we even agree to give a talk to understand what what does the, the group of presenters look like and how, uh, how can that be more diverse before we would even agree uh, to speak. And similarly, we're trying to translate that now to the journal. Um, and actually the, the example of your research that you described, you know, I would love to actually, we'd, we'd be happy to be a guinea pig and learn, you know, actually using some of that software and some of the opportunities to, to characterize what does the, the author group look like the past six months? Uh, and then now as we go forward with, um, our double bond reviews, are there demonstrable associations there that, that we can see in terms of diverse author groups. But I'd love to see us push the envelope in weeks and, and months from now. Are there things that we can be doing to say that really we're mandating diverse author groups um, to, to consider these um, publications at our journal? And I, I think that's what really gets to the pipeline challenge. We must make sure, as Ani noted, that you know, there's not going to be a diverse author group for a clinical trial that's coming out if there wasn't a diverse investigator group. So 
Minnow Walsh and others, I think, have done a really good job. Uh, Mona Fuzad and Joanne Lindenfeld of highlighting in other journals some of the efforts to focus on diversity of research groups. So it really needs to move upstream of the publications process. And I'm hopeful that we can outline some of the key steps from a journal standpoint about how we can support that and have accountability uh, and broader change across academia. Yeah, no, no, excellent. Uh, I mean, and, you know, I'm, I'm sort of going to take you and both you and Anu up on that, you know, um, maybe at the end of the year, we, we can do an analysis for just a journal of cardiac failure, uh, looking into patterns of editorials and, you know, just to drive home the point um, to sort of objectively in a scientific fashion demonstrate the efficacy of some of the interventions. You've targeted interventions that you've done to promote DEI and B and, you know, maybe, uh, you know, can, we can do this together as a team and you can have other editors as authors and we can publish this in, in Journal of Cardiac Failure if, if that is of interest to, to, to both you and Anu and, and others. I'm, I'm happy to sort of take that on as a, as a project and sort of work together. Um, you know, if, if, if that's of interest to, to you, to, to both of you. Yeah, that, that would be fantastic. We've, we've been uh, working through the details about, you know, how do we collect the data to now and uh, to really inform the analytic approach. So uh, maybe one of the critical pieces to already come out of this podcast is, uh, is a data approach that, that we'll learn from you. So, so thank you for that. Oh, no, no, it'll be, it'll be a pleasure, you know, quite frankly, to collaborate. You know, it's always good to push the envelope for the right reasons and, you know, I think if the heart is at the right place, then good things happen. And if good people collaborate, then, you know, you only quadruple the effect. Um, so, you know, happy to be a part of it and happy to chime in in whatever fashion, shape or form I can. We'll recruit you from the interventional world, I'm okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, I was I was telling Anu the other day, you know, I think the heart failure group seems to be a lot more cooler than the interventional group. So, you know, with, with all due respect, to, you know, I don't, I don't want to feel that the intervent, that I'm being usurped into the heart failure world, but, um, um, so, um, a few, few more questions, right? Um, why do you, th- and, you know, I, uh, and, you know, I would give kudos, kudos to Dr. Fuster, who for the first time introduced an early career section and a fellows in training section for a journal as prestigious as Jack. And I, I think other journals have followed suit, but I, I really think he had the vision. Uh, to sort of introduce that section for the journal. And, you know, I've been a contributor to that section. Um, I've, I think, contributed, I think, almost five pieces now. Uh, and I, I follow that that space in the journal because, you know, it's it's a voice that represents a, um, a significant component of, you know, what we do as cardiologists, you know, at least in the academic world. Uh, and, you know, these are um, the, the future of cardiovascular medicine. So, what, what was it that prompted Journal of Cardiac Failure to introduce a, a rising, or, or you know, a rising stars or an early career section? And why do you think that that is something that's important as editors? Like why, like why, why is it important to have that section? What, what are your what are your thoughts on that question? So, so I'm happy to make a couple of comments. So um, I think in addition to the early career. Um, piece, we also have a patient and caregiver center. And as we were thinking, what can we do differently? How can we do better uh, at JCF? This is one of the things that Anu and I, with our team, we've been talking about. And I think the the ECT spotlight has just been so invigorating and refreshing to see these submissions come in from brilliant young minds. And I was struck on one of the recent clubhouses with Clyde Yancey as he was talking through this, saying like, the younger generation, uh, those earlier in training, they are the future. So if we're not including their perspectives, uh, their research, and really profiling and lifting them up, um, then, then we're missing the boat. And during one of the recent sessions, uh, Andrew Sauer just led this great meeting. And one of our fellow uh, editors, Quentin, uh, gave this beautiful talk about lifting as you climb. This idea that as we are each striving to be uh, the best clinician we can be, the best research researcher we can be, thinking about mentorship and and really lifting the next generation, and that was something that that has really stuck with me. And it's 
it's been just such an honor to work with our fellows, Ashish and Vanessa as well, bringing these unique perspectives, pushing us to think differently about the journal. And then now that's really complemented by some of the activities that Martha Gulati and our patient representative on our editorial team, Julian Code, about how do we do this at the patient caregiver center as well in learning from patients about the journey and how can we as clinicians every single day pivot and really pull in the patient voice, the caregiver voice, that really, this is why we all went into medicine. This is why we want to be researchers is to improve the patient journey. So if in, you know, every time you pick up the journal of cardiac failure, yes, there's exceptional science, but it really brings and is anchored in early career individuals in the future of medicine, but also having patients and caregivers front and center. It's just been something that I found so refreshing and exciting at the journal. And I'm thankful that Anu and I have had this opportunity to learn from our team around that. Yeah, Rob, I'm, I'm laughing because I think we spend so much time together that we're like, our thoughts are becoming very similar. So I was going to say the exact same thing. It, this just makes me thinking, that's, this just makes me think of Quentin's talk, as you said, is this notion of lifting as you climb is just so beautiful. And it also, again, comes back down, comes back to, it, it's one thing to say it, but what are we doing about it? And so having a dedicated section is, you know, at least our attempt to walk the walk. And then what's also just really beautiful is then amplifying those voices via social media platforms and others and hopefully citing their work and talks. It's just wonderful to see a stage that is just for individuals at that level of training. And I think, um, Again, this comes down to everybody wants to feel seen. There are so many people doing so much wonderful work. Um, and I think shining a spotlight there is just so critical. And it's been in, just incredibly rewarding, as as Rob said. Yeah, I guess the, the only additional comment I would make around it is just that we've learned so much from our team around how words matter. And the example I would give uh, is that some of our colleagues from Canada uh, who who are, you know, in the, the, this heart failure community, they say, wow, like, it blows our mind that you, you introduce yourself as a heart failure cardiologist or you open with um, talking to patients about heart failure. And, yes, we're not meaning to, to reduce the severity of the disease, but, but they say bringing the focus to heart function, heart success, how do we reframe the language to set patients up for success. Um, and, and I think that's really what's been exciting for us. Of, yes, we are going to have exceptional quality science, but we really want JCF to be a movement that, that changes how we think about medicine, that gets over the burnout that many of us are feeling on a day-to-day basis. We, we want to fill up uh, the clinicians, the readers' buckets um, by focusing on some of these aspects that, that really matter and Maybe in that context, Anu, do you want to share your story about um, your patient and the gift they gave you around heart success? Yeah, sure. I, I This is something that I think we, we feel so passionately about. And, I, you know, for me, it, it literally just, I feel like it's become a mission. You know, the more we can spread this um, kind of, this desire to rethink the words we use. I mean, heart function for sure is at the the forefront of what we would like to hopefully see more of, but also this, uh, this notion of starting out a, a history and physical exam with chief complaint, you know, you're starting off the story with opposing forces, right? A patient on one side and you on the other side of the fence receiving a complaint. So it it immediately, when you hear the word complaint, puts one on the defense. And so if we think about changing that to chief concern or primary concern, um, I think it can be so powerful. And similarly, when we think about we, we often use the term, like, especially in the case of a, acute heart failure, oh, patient presented an acute heart failure in the setting of non-compliance or non-adherence. And we use that casually, but 
there's a story behind that, right? Every patient, every individual has a story behind why or why not they could take their meds. And if we think about barriers to adherence instead, um, I think it allows us to connect with patients on a more personal level and and understand where they're coming from. And to come back to your point, Rob, I um, I have you know, I introduce myself as a heart function doctor now. Um, I try to tell patients uh, at every step of the way that, you know, we're talking about heart function um, and and don't use the other F word, so to speak. And one patient I had is a, a young uh, father who was diagnosed uh, with acute heart failure. Um, and he, he said to me, he said, don't tell me that. I don't want to hear that. I've never failed at anything in my life. I just can't accept it. And, and the barrier around language was actually impeding his care. And so changing our vernacular to thinking about function was so appealing to him. And it resonated so deeply with him that once we established this connection and he did get better, thankfully, on, on good medical therapy, he and his wife actually made me keychains that say heart function, not failure. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you've seen we use that as a hashtag really often in, in a lot of um, the tweets we have around the journal and the work that comes out of it. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's just a beautiful story. And, you know, I, I do think that the 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 leaders in in you and rob and how you've um, positioned the journal of cardiac failure to be you know one of the key journals in the subspecialty of heart function i should say now i can still learn (laughs) um uh, you know i think um is going to be pivotal in how you know the future generations of cardiologists and heart function specialists are going to describe this entity um, you know, and you know, it's, it's, in, I mean, our patients are beneficiaries of, of this incredible medical therapy that we now have, right. That, that forms the cornerstone, the, the quadruple backbone. I mean, I've seen just incredible improvements in systolic function. Once I've introduced, you know, both the SGLT2I and, and a mineralocorticoid to a backbone of uh, a beta blocker and an ORNI. Uh, it's just incredible how much these new medications, you know, have an effect on, on systolic function. And, and I'm sure you see this more often than I do, but, you know, every now and then when I have a, a patient, you know, with, for example, you know, coronary embolus and, or maybe tachycardiometered cardiomyopathy and now is rate controlled, but the EF is, is still low. I mean, this, the introduction of these newer agents is, is just, it's miraculous how quickly the EF responds. Has that been your experience also? Or is it just my two anecdotes? that I often talk about. No, I agree with you wholeheartedly. You know, I think folks like Greg Fonro and others have, have really led the way in emphasizing the importance of getting all patients on these foundational therapies, obviously pulling in the appropriate personalization that's needed, but, but this idea of we've got to get over the clinical inertia. We need to get these therapies on efficiently or as quickly as possible and at the right dose. And, and that's really what we've seen. I think, I'm sure Anu can say this week alone, seeing multiple patients that, that are doing so much better um, and also balancing that story, right? So we also see patients whose ejection fraction might not improve despite exceptional therapy, but their symptoms resolve. Uh, so I, I think actually having these conversations, incorporating some of the, the wording that we've used here and really keeping the patient at the center of this uh, really is a story um, that, that we're trying to move forward with. Yeah, I know, I know. Do you want to chime in? I couldn't agree more. I think medical therapy is, it's just a very exciting time to be in this field. I mean, we have just seen tremendous um, strides in terms of scientific development, and now it's incumbent upon us to carry it out into clinical practice. And, you know, inertia is just... It almost feels like it's it, it in this day and age can be equated with with doing harm, you know, um, even though it's a much more passive form of doing so. And so I, you know, I um, am proud to serve as the program director for the Advanced Heart Failure Fellowship at Sinai, and in precepting fellows clinic, 
you know, it comes up all the time to the best of us. Oh, blood pressure is, you know, 98 over 56. And I don't really want to push it. You know, the interest was already at 49.51 and they're already on spironolactone at 12.5 and metoprolol XL at 75. I think they're good where they are. And pushing fellows and by virtue of doing so myself, reminding myself that there's more to do, add that SGLT2 inhibitor, go up on the doses, um, really, really try and um, push uh, these life-saving therapies to their limit so that we can get the best quote unquote bang for our buck. And I think having that conversation with patients about function again in this context is actually really helpful, right? Because, and I think, you know, Dr. Boscourt has done a, a beautiful job amongst others in, in introducing new terminology in terms of how we define and think about heart failure in general, where now we want to focus on patients who have active symptoms as having heart failure, who then with the use of guideline directed medical therapy can enter a state of being in remission, right? Borrowing that terminology from the oncology world, I think actually facilitates better understanding between clinician and patient. And then if you have persistent symptoms, despite medical therapy, you have persistent heart failure, right? And in that case, whether it's about escalating therapy or then considering advanced therapies, obviously depends on the individual clinical scenario. But again, coming back to this notion of function is so critical because it's not only about the cardiac muscle function or the pump function, but it's also about the patients functioning as human beings in their day-to-day life. Yeah, maybe the kind of only other thing I would add to that to bring it back to your question about the excitement we see as, as patients improve on foundational therapies for HFREF uh, is the concept of them feeling so much better. And that's what I've loved in my Monday afternoon clinics, having these conversations with patients where when we transition you to RNA and we start an SGLT2 inhibitor, it's likely you're going to feel better and often feeling better pretty quickly. So I think as the real world evidence as well as trial data have supported this early, not only the clinical outcome benefit, but the functional status and quality of life benefit, that makes these conversations so much fun. Uh, and then the actual reality of when you see that patient back in, in the following weeks that they say, wow, I'm actually feeling a lot better in getting back to the activities that I used to enjoy. So, so I think there's really no time better than today as a heart failure clinician with all of the opportunities uh, that we have in terms of starting medications, but also thinking about other behavioral and, uh, and exercise training and other aspects to really improve the holistic uh, picture for our patients' lives. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so I think we're, we're getting on the hour, um, Anu and, and Rob. Any closing remarks? Uh, well, first off, it's been an incredible conversation. Thank you for the time on a late Wednesday evening. Um, but any closing remarks, uh, anything you, you think I, I should have asked, I didn't ask on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Cause you know, it's still an evolving topic. I know it's become the buzzword. Uh, but you know, more than any other journal, I think Journal of Cardiac Failure has done the most, at least to me, has done the most in being, you know, very proactive and practical and actually implementing. So just, like Anu said earlier on the show, you know, like walking the talk, not just talking the talk. Um, so, you know, congratulations and kudos to both of you for walking your talks. Uh, but any, any closing remarks for the podcast, any closing remarks for the listeners? I, I guess one thing I would just love to say, first of all, thank you so much for having us. It's, it's really an honor and a privilege. And it's also so wonderful to see to have these opportunities to connect with people that we wouldn't otherwise connect with through such forums. And so it, it's really been a privilege for, for us. Um, the only other aspect that we didn't get to touch on in this hour is also the, the reach across uh, ge- geographic borders and in, involving our international colleagues. You know, as you said, this is also the official journal for the Japanese Heart Failure Society. And it's been just so fun and rewarding in uh, connecting with our Japanese editors and uh, the society there, learning how things are practiced differently, interpreted differently, 
Um, and also how much we do that is the same. And so, I, I, again, I think that is such an essential part to our uh, better understanding what DEI and B uh, mean broadly. And it's been a really wonderful process. I hope it's our intention, certainly, over the next six months to a year to amplify those relationships um, and, and hopefully have some practical uh, output as a result. And then I would just, you know, end with saying that uh, Rob has already highlighted beautifully that it's not just about the journal. It's for us, this has become a, a real sincere personal passion for both of us. Rob, I'm speaking for you too. Um, and it, like, like he said, it's, it's become for us a movement you know, what does this mean to us as individuals? Can we stand by what we're putting forth and uh, and hopefully result in more belonging for, for anyone who crosses our path, um, whether it's sharing a patient story, um, providing a perspective, uh, of course, you know, disseminating original science um, or the ECT spotlight, patient perspective, caregiver perspective, et cetera. Uh, I think, you know, ultimately our goal and mission and intention is to have a platform where there are many different voices that are shared and uh, a sense of belonging is shared by all. Yeah, thanks, Anna. I mean, perfectly stated. I guess I'd kind of close with first a huge thank you. I really enjoyed this and appreciate the opportunity and would echo kind of a couple of things that you said. One, around the international footprint, and certainly we, we have strong representation in Europe, in Asia, and in uh, our, our northern border in Canada, but we're also really wanting to expand more broadly in Latin America as well, so important efforts there. Um, and then finally, just to really, as you noted, we're we really on the DEI front, we want to push the envelope. We want to have meaningful change, but it's not a one-off. We really want this to be a thread that continues but importantly, that it's also sustainable. We want to make sure that this isn't just something we're doing this summer, that this is something that continues every day, every week, every month for, for as long as we're fortunate to be in these roles. And uh, it's in that context that I've been thrilled now that we'll be launching our diversity task force. And Melvin Eccles is going to be helping us lead that, just a, a truly a visionary individual uh, that will put together an incredible team uh, around that. And I would just close by saying, bringing it back to this DEI and actually focusing on the inclusion piece. We, we want to include you, the listener. Uh, and this is something that I've just absolutely loved that when we took over the helm, you know, we'd get uh, direct messages on Twitter from including Jillian Code, who's now part of our team that said, I want to be part of this. Uh, and, and we welcome you. We want you to be part of this movement. Share your stories with us, challenge us, get involved and let us know how we can continue to do better. So, so thank you for, for this opportunity to serve the cardiology community. Oh, no, excellent. No, I mean, this has been a terrific conversation. And, you know, again, thank you both for, you know, sparing the time and, you know, having this conversation with, with me. And so, you know, thanks again. Thanks again. Everybody have a good night. Thank you. Good night. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast produced by Radcliffe Cardiology in association with makeadent.org. We aim to bring you a new angle of all things cardiology every second week. Review us on your favourite podcast app or send your comments or questions to podcast at radcliffe-group.com. To view the series, head to radcliffecardiology.com forward slash podcasts forward slash parallax. Thanks for listening.